Not a grief nor a loss, not a frown nor a cross, but is blessed if we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. But we never can prove the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay for the favor he shows and the joy he bestows are for them who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet, or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Okay, for our opening song, let's all stand and we'll sing number 343. 343. Okay, I think we're going to sing this a cappella because I definitely know that was not the right melody. <laughs> I will sing of my Redeemer and his wondrous love to me. On the cruel cross he suffered from the first to set me free. Sing, oh, sing of my Redeemer, with his blood he purchased me. On the cross he sealed my pardon, paid the debt and made me free. I will tell the wondrous story, how my lost this day to save in his boundless love and mercy he the ransom freely gave sing oh sing of my redeemer with his blood he purchased me on the cross he sealed my pardon, paid the debt and made me free. I will sing of my Redeemer and his heavenly love to me. He from death to life 
life has brought me, Son of God, with him to be. Sing, O oh, sing of my Redeemer, with his blood he purchased me. On the cross he sealed my pardon, paid the debt and made me free. Thank you. You may be seated. Good morning, all. It's good to see everyone. Do you think that this is the end of our winter? I heard the other day someone say, this is the last of the cold, cold days. You don't believe it? I like to believe that. I have faith. <laughs> yeah. It could, it could change. We live in Missouri, so I understand that. Um, we have a few announcements and a couple of uh, issues of business we need to deal with. There is a second reading for transfer that we need to uh, ask for a uh, vote on. Rizuma Resnell and Rizuma Alusian from Kansas City Central to Independence Ebenezer Spanish SDA Church, and Yosef Wakwaya from Kansas City Central to Dallas First SDA Church. Do I have a motion to accept? Do we have a second? Second? All in favor, raise your hand. All opposed, any questions? Motion carries. Okay. Um, a reminder, if anybody's interested, Summit View is having uh, um, hot lunches for everyone, so if you're willing to be involved in that and help out with that, kind of list the criteria there in your bulletin, just read through that and, uh, and let them know. Um, I think uh, Lindsay is the one you need to contact down at the bottom there. She's got her email there for you to, to get a hold of her. Um, other than that, I think we are good and we are ready for our children's story. Work people. Okay. Before I get started with the children's story, I want to find out how many of you remembered to look to see how many animals, birds, whatever creatures, names you could find in the Bible. How many remembered to do that? Eli, raise your hand. Helen, raise your hand because you were here. Sabbath evening with me, and we were researching. So raise your hands. <laughs> okay. Oh, I don't know about you all. Okay. So um, I used our church library. We have books like this in our church library that have birds and mammals. And we also have this book that says Bible Animals. I didn't really get into this one too much, but I did these. And, uh, of course, I started with the Bible and tried, you know, I gave you a hint last week where to find uh, a bunch of names. Um, I actually talked with Laura this morning, and actually Laura found more uh, Bible names and what I found. 
But even just looking for different names of animals, and, you know, there are some strange names in the Bible. Animals, birds, that I had no idea what they were. So these little books were kind of useful because they actually had pictures that I could go, oh, that's what that kind of looks like. But I came up with 80, 80 different names of animals and birds and insects and all that kind of stuff. Laura got more than I did. Charles used the modern research tool, and so did Eli. And they came up with, I think it was 100 in one place and 120 in another. I know that Eli didn't write them down, but I know that he was helping look. So it was kind of fun, kind of interesting to find the different animals and to find out what the Bible had to say about all these things. But that's last week. Okay. This week... I want you to know, God is really persistent. Did you know that? Um, God was impressing me, uh, the story, and I wasn't too, really, I wasn't too thrilled about what he wanted me to talk about today, but he was persistent. Early in the morning, he would, when I would wake up, he would put into my head, the same things over and over and again. Okay, okay, God, I got it. This is what you want me to talk about. So, I need you all to help me today. First thing I need you to do is close your eyes and no peeking. And I want you to take your two hands and place them over your eyes and no peeking. Can you see anything? No, you're in darkness. We are all sinners. We are all in darkness. The hands over our eyes represents we do what we want to do. But then, somewhere along the line, we hear or see or read Words like, for God so loved the world. And it makes our hands come down from our eyes. So lower your hands. And we begin to open our eyes. And we say, maybe there is a God. We begin to see, but we're still sinners. We are still not seeing the world as we should. God says in his Bible, I love you. Can you see yourself? Can you see yourself in God's heart? No, you're too far away. You cannot see yourself. God is calling you to him. Come to me. Learn of me. Sometimes... Somebody will say to you, I understand what God wants you to do. Let me read in the Bible what it says. I think this is what the Bible says. Now, do you see a problem with, with me? Yeah, I'm saying what I think the Bible says. Do you see another problem with me? I have dark glasses. I, how many of you think that I can even read this? Can you read this? Oh, look, this is what the Bible says. Can you see it? No, because you are not reading it yourself. And really, I can't see it either. I can't read. I do not understand what these words are saying mostly because I don't have my glasses on. But you get the point, right? Some people think they know what the truth is, but they're looking through a dark glass. They're still looking through sin. So they can't see what God wants them 
to know, for you to know. The only way you're going to know what God is telling you is for you to listen to God, for you to read his word yourself. If you can't read, and I'm talking now to the children that are young, you still can talk to God, and he can talk to you. I know he can talk to you because, like I told you earlier, he talks to me. He wakes me up and says, this is what you need to talk about. And I keep saying, but God, and he says, but Maurice, listen to me. If you get closer to God's heart, you will see yourself as the apple of his eye, as the center of all his love. He's pouring out your love to him each. He's pouring out his love to you each and every day. All he wants is for you to love him back. All right, let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you for loving us so much. Thank you for being persistent and not letting me get out of telling these people and these children what you want them to hear. Forgive us where we have sinned. Forgive us of our sins. Open our eyes so that we will recognize our sins. Fill us with your love and cleanse us with your righteousness. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Tears of joy, okay. For our introduction to worship, let's um, stand and sing, Speak, O Lord. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. Take your truth, plant it deep in us, righteousness and your righteousness. Thank you for your Sabbath and the weather outside. We just praise your name in Jesus' name. Amen. It is time for our tithe and offering appeal. And I've got a little story here to read. Our, uh, if you look at our uh, financial corner, it actually is uh, combined youth ministries as the offering this week. Is that right? Yes. A regular and dispensable, dependable God. First Kings seventeen fourteen says, "For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says." The jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day of the Lord sends rain on the land. We choose to give regularly and systematically when the regularity of God's care for us. 
The story of the Shumanite widow's oil and flour testifies loudly about the God whose compassions never fail and are new every morning. Lamentations 3, 22, 23. Every single day during these three and a half years of famine, there was food on her table. She never missed a single meal. God faithfully realized his promise in response to the widow's action to provide first for Elijah, the man of God. During those days of scarcity, God's miracle was as consistent as the dawn. God remains consistent even today. A family had recently settled in a new country and encountered some financial troubles. Their family's budget was not balancing. They decided to skim out all uh, expenses that weren't necessary, but that wasn't enough. It was now time for some drastic decisions, either to cut their giving to the church or to not enroll their son in piano lessons. Both decisions would be temporary until their financial condition improved. Prayerfully, but painfully, they chose the second option. A few days later, early in the morning, the wife picked up an envelope from the living room floor. It was sealed and had nothing written on it. When they opened the envelope, great was their surprise to find money inside. The amount was more than enough for the fee of the last three months of the piano lessons. They experienced the consistency of God's care. Some life circumstances may tempt us to interrupt our regularity in worshiping God with our resources. This is our struggle. Let us allow God's faithfulness and regularity to inspire us each and every time. This week, in response to God's consistency, we worship him with our tithes and regular offerings. The deacons, please rise. Lord, thank you for being the unchanging, eternal God on whom we can depend for our daily sustenance. Help us to reflect your image and regularity and faithfulness. Amen. now time for our intercessory prayer. So as far as possible, if we can all kneel and ask the Lord to be with our service. Dear Heavenly Father, we have many requests. Lord, we know that there are things going on in this world. We can think of uh, the conflict over in Europe right now. We just pray that you would have your hand in that, that you would stay the problems and push back any issues that would kill and maim. Lord, we know that the devil is involved in this too and that he pushes against you, but we know you're more powerful. We thank you for being the God that takes care of us especially as we mentioned in our tithes and offerings. Lord, we know that each and every um, response to uh, problems and famines and, and shortcomings, you're, you're always there to provide. We thank you for that. We pray for each and every family member and child that has gone astray or walked away. We thank you, Lord, that we are able to ask you to intervene to take care of things, and to bring things back right. Lord, we know there are problems in this world, but right here in our own homes, in our own country, we have many. We pray that you would be with individuals that are having spiritual or physical problems. We pray that you would get them back online with you. Help them to understand how important the connection is that we talk to you every day that we ask for the things that we need and praise you for the things that you give us. 
We thank you again, Lord, and I just pray that you would be with Roger in his words today. Be with the message that we can receive a blessing that we'd be able to share with others. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Isaiah 64, 8 and 9. Isaiah 64, verse 8. But now, O Lord, thou art our Father, we are the clay, and thou art the potter, and we all are the work of thine hands. But not wrath every stone, O Lord, neither remember iniquity forever. Behold, see, we beseech thee. We are all thy people. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Where two or three are gathered together, God is there among them, right? Amen. The word of God is a book of Heroes and villains, winners and losers, the living and dead. I hesitate to use the word hero because that is a word from Greek mythology, but it does relay the thought. Uh, and uh, to clarify the living and the dead, the living referred to is, are those who live forever have eternal life. The dead are those who have eternal non-existence. And uh, now the chief, and we'll use the word again, heroes are the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Can you hear me? If you can't, raise your hand and I will repeat. So I'll try to notice that. If the heroes of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who are the villains? They are the devil and his fallen angels. We, the people, if we are in Christ Jesus, can be heroes. We can be winners and be among the living. The Bible says we are going to be priests and kings and sit with Jesus in his throne. Now, if that isn't being a winner, I don't know what is. In Christ Jesus, that term, here's one definition. That is, if we embrace him, embrace his leadership, and embrace his actions in our lives, then we are in Christ Jesus. There are other definitions, but if you don't have those, I don't think it's a viable thing. So if you are heroes in Christ, winners in Christ, what could be some pitfalls on the way to eternal life? Let's go back in time. Nebuchadnezzar's army had already reached the northern city of Dan. The prophet Jeremiah had prophesied much about this king of the north, about him being on his way and why he was on his way. Now the prophet began to grieve. In Jeremiah 8, 18 through 22, he says, When I heard this, I was sick at heart. I tried to comfort myself in the Lord, but the pain within me would not go away. Listen to the cry of my people throughout the land. I can hear it now. They will cry out, where is the Lord? Is he no longer king of Jerusalem? The Lord will say, you have left me for your idols and have worshipped 
those lifeless gods. Why have you done that? Jeremiah then says, Surely the harvest has passed, the summer has ended, and we are not saved. I hurt because my people hurt. Horror grips my soul as I sit and I mourn. Is there no balm in Gilead, no healing salve? Is there no physician there? Is there no medicine that can heal the wounds of my people? For centuries, all around the chosen people were heard the cries of the distressed. And it's the same today. The wants of these distressed souls only the love of Christ can satisfy. Amen? If Christ is abiding in us, our hearts will be full of divine sympathy. And this earnest, Christ-like love will be unsealed, untapped. This had not happened in Israel or Judah. What had happened to Israel and what can we learn from their hopeful experience? The prophet Isaiah has something to say about that. And Isaiah 45, 9 says, Woe to you who argue with your maker. You're only a piece of pottery. Does a clay vessel argue with he who shapes it? Does the clay say, What are you doing to me? Does a vessel accuse its maker of poor workmanship? So those who argue with God have this view, which is a perversion of reality. Some might say it's a bad attitude. They seem to be trying to shape God into what they want him to be. Isaiah again says in 29 verse 16, Who turn things upside down? Shall the potter be regarded as the clay that the thing made should say of its maker? Well, he did not make me. Or the thing formed say of him who formed it? Well, he doesn't understand correctly. That's another bad attitude, right? Another perversion of reality. They tried to shape God. Sometimes do we? Again, Isaiah 64, 8 and 9, the scripture reading, But you are our Father, Lord. You are the potter, and we are the clay. We are the work of your hands. Lord, don't be angry with us or hold our sins against us forever. Please look down upon us and help us, for we are still your people. Now, that's a better attitude, isn't it? Uh, the reality is God is the master potter. So clearly, idol-worshiping Israel had developed a culture where they could form God in their image instead of letting God form them in his image. They were being shaped by the world. They were being shaped by the nations all around them. Now, after the Babylonian captivity, when the Persian king Artaxerxes allowed them to go restore and rebuild Jerusalem, you'll remember that, the chief priests and the elders, they did something. During this 400-year period before the birth of Jesus, they purposed in their hearts to protect the Judean culture. One, because they had become like the other nations, and two, they had been captive of the Babylonians, and they didn't want that to happen again. And so they proceeded to make layers and layers of laws, rituals, and traditions for the protection of what they perceived as a better culture a, or the best way of life. But through all these things, people could not see God's will. There were so many layers that could not see the light, much less be a light to the Gentiles. Now, Jesus 
will find collided with this type of cultural protection. He resisted being shaped by the culture. So during this time, from the earliest age, these little children, the Jewish child was surrounded with the requirements of the rabbis. Rigid rules were prescribed for every act down to the smallest details of life. So under the synagogue teachers, the youth were instructed in the countless regulations which as Orthodox Israelites, they were expected to observe. But Jesus did not interest himself in these matters. From childhood, he acted independently of the rabbinical laws. The scriptures of the Old Testament were his constant study. Now, Thus saith the Lord, was on his lips. Now, as the condition of the people began to open to Jesus' mind, he saw that the requirements of the culture and the requirements of God were in constant collision. The people were departing from the Word of God and exalting theories of their own invention. We don't see that today, do we? I'd say yes, we do. They were observing traditional rites that had no virtue. Through the practice of this continual round of rituals, the truths that were supposed to be taught were hidden from view. The worshipers could not see the truth. Jesus saw in these faithless services that people found no peace. Now, since Jesus had come to teach the true meaning of worship, he could not sanction the mingling of human requirements with divine precepts. Now, this reminds me of Revelation 14, 8. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. This is the wine of false doctrine something that covers the truth. It covers the truth with another way of, uh, well, other commandments, another uh, God, in fact. So the truth is covered. Now, in many circles, we see the same today. But in other circles, it's a let's kick back attitude enjoy the coffee and the conversation and say God loves us and we could laugh at all those who try to keep the commandments and make a big to do over nothing. And you know, we have 5,000 members so we can kick in a buck and our church can glory over helping the poor. You see this pendulum of extremes swings both ways. Both are a culture devoid of Christ and devoid of leaning on his righteousness. Now, Jesus was very gentle and submissive, and he tried to please everyone. But he always asked for the authority of the Holy Scriptures to justify the rabbi's persuasions. And Jesus seemed to know the Scripture from beginning to end, and he would present them in their true importance. The rabbis didn't like, they were, didn't like this at all, that they were being taught by a child. But they continued to say that it was their place to explain the Scripture and his place to accept their interpretation. Now, even though the rabbis knew that he had a much more advanced understanding of Scripture than they did, still they were angry that he would not obey their dictates. So con failing to convince him, they took their complaint to Joseph and Mary and set before them his noncompliance. So he suffered rebuke and censorship from his own parents. The rabbis continued to harass him, to, to uh, uh, threaten him, and to try to intimidate him. 
when Jesus became an adult, after his baptism and his anointing by the Holy Spirit, the scribes and the Pharisees would have spies follow him and try to catch him in, in some transgression of the law. The first incident was when he healed on the Sabbath. That's in Mark chapter 3. Jesus' healing conflicted with the Pharisees' strict Sabbath laws, so they then went directly to the Herodians, a group fully uh, dedicated to Herod and conspired to destroy Jesus. He was, a, he was a threat. He was a threat to their culture and to their authority over that culture. Now, the second incident was, as usual, based on the Pharisees' complaint that Jesus disregarded the traditional precepts, these very same precepts that encumbered the law of God. Specifically, this one involved ceremonial purification. Uh, this was that if anyone neglected these forms to be observed before eating was considered a grievous sin and punishable both in this world and the one to come. And it was regarded a virtue to destroy the transgressor. Wow. Now the worst of it is that these Ceremonial purification rituals were so numerous that a lifetime was not sufficient to learn them all. I had a Catholic friend in Topeka, Kansas. He said once, he said, Roger, the priest in Jesus' day were like the priest today. And it took me a long time thinking about that, but as we read these things, it appears that they are indeed very similar. The, accusation, the accusations of the Pharisees was this. Why do your disciples transgress the traditions of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. Now, that's not just talking about hygiene. This is uh, something else. This is an elaborate ceremonial washing that was very, uh, very complicated. Now, Jesus made no attempt to defend himself or his disciples. Why? Well, I, I don't know, but it, it seems it might be because it was such a silly thing they were requiring it deserved no direct response. But he did say this, Full well, you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your own tradition. Now, these formalities or rituals, uh, what do we think of these? You know, I would suggest that the question that most concerns us should be, do I believe in the saving, with saving faith, on the Son of God? Is my life in harmony with the divine law? Every adjective describing God's law are the same adjectives that describe God himself. You cannot separate God from his law. The law is a representation of God's character. Some say it is a transcript of God's character. In John 3, 36, it says, He that believes on the Son of God has everlasting life. And he that believes not on the Son shall not see life. And it adds, but the wrath of God is on him. Sometime later, we may, may do a follow-up sermon, and we'll cover the wrath of God at that time. We won't cover that today. And 1 John 2, 3 says, and hereby do we know that we know him. If we keep his commandments throughout Scripture, obedience to divine law is a theme. 
This is the issue. That's the whole issue. Obedience to God's will as portrayed in his law. Obedience, not in our own strength, but through his grace, his righteousness, and his strength by faith in him. The prophet Jeremiah talks about a righteous branch and a king that shall reign and prosper forever. And in verse 6, it says, In his days, Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely, and this is the name by which he shall be called, the Lord our righteousness. Now, who's the he? That's this, this righteous branch, this king that shall reign forever. He. Now, we'll, we'll advance here to chapter 33 of Jeremiah, verse 16. It adds the word Jerusalem. It says, In those days shall Judah be saved, and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And this is the name by which she shall be called, the Lord our righteousness. Is it confusing? Not really. Folks, this is what the saved are all about. Uh, all about. This is their name. It is the name of the new Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem, she is the bride of Christ. And the new Jerusalem is the home of the redeemed. That's why it's called she. She is the Lord, our righteousness. Christ is our righteousness. We have none of our own. We depend upon Jesus and his righteousness. Now, Jesus continued to point out that their tradition of the scribes and the Pharisees, this tradition of Korban, overrode the fifth commandment. Now, what is the fifth commandment? Honor your father and your mother. Now, here's the way this Korban works. If an undutiful child did not want to take care of their parents, then they would pronounce korban over their property, over all their assets. And all these assets were then automatically committed to the temple. The child then was free from helping his parents, and then on his death, the property went to the temple correction. It went to the priest and the rabbis, who then became every year more and more wealthy. It was a type of self-aggrandizement that they had created. Jesus said, you hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, this people draws near me with their mouth and honor me with their lips but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. The words of Christ were an arraignment of the whole system of Pharisaism, and today an arraignment of the system of Babylon and the wine of Babylon, which is the false doctrines and the isms that form the culture we live in, which is a perversion of reality. We're not really living in reality if we hold to these things. To the people and to the disciples, Jesus then explained that defilement comes not from without because it's not something that you can wash off but it comes from within. It's the evil deed, the evil word, the evil thought, the transgression of God's law. This is what defiles a person. So Jesus, he overcame culture. His kingdom is not of this culture. It is not of this world. Jesus was crucified because he was a threat to the culture.
In John 16, it says, These things I have spoken to you, that you might have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. When we are in Christ Jesus, we also overcome the culture, which we see now is the world. And we fulfill Revelation 14, 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. A companion text is Isaiah 8.20. I think we all know that. To the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to these, it is because there is no light in them. In a general sense, this means that we internalize Scripture, the law and the testimony. But in a specific sense, we're clinging to and relying on His character, on His righteousness, and clinging to His testimony when He overcame the world by living a sinless life and paying the penalty for our sin at the cross. Uh, so, so we have been here emphasizing the concept of being formed by the culture versus being formed by the Creator. We can also call being formed by the culture the miseducation of God's people. Lucifer miseducated a third of the angels. And he miseducated Adam and Eve. So, fellow believers, if we follow our God, there will be no miseducation in our lives. The miseducation of God's people is in this thought. Because something is happening to me, it must be about me. But it's never about us. It's about him. It's never about who I am. It's about who I am with. This thought will save us a lot of confusion. Some of you may remember uh, before the, the last presidential election, but the one before that, Central Church had an end time seminar in Harrisonville. There were, as I recall, 32 people, 30 some people uh, that attended for probably a week and a half. And we observed that there were probably at least 10 people who exhibited worry about who would be the next president. Some verbalized that one of the candidates was a type of Cyrus, the Persian king who had. Uh, 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 defeated Babylon and liberated the Jewish people. And they said uh, this candidate would be, a, would be good for the church. It seems they were mingling the state with the church. And we noticed that on nights of the pres presidential debates, the attendance was mysteriously low. And those who did attend, got up and left early so they could watch the debates. So, folks, it's not about political parties. It's not about who wants to be in charge. No president or religious ruler can ever truly set us free. Our job is to let people know who our God is. John 8, 36, it says, If the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Everyone needs to know that. It's not about anything else. If we think the ballot box has anything to do with freedom, then God's people are being miseducated. In other words, they're being formed by the culture instead of by Jesus 
the master potter. There is a call to action. It's the cry of the Protestant Reformation. Only Christ, only faith, only scripture, only grace. Hebrews 12, 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. There he is mediating for us. So, folks, let's go boldly to the throne of grace that we may find mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Hebrews 4.16. There's a text in John chapter 3, verse 29. After some thinking, it, it appears to be talking about maintaining the proper relationship with Christ and with those being witnessed to. It's in context of being the friend of the bridegroom, the friend of the bridegroom. In a wedding today, a true friend of the groom, which is symbolic, symbolic of Christ, will have joy over the groom's words. A true friend will draw attention to the groom. Now, the bride, which is a symbol of God's church and ultimately the New Jerusalem we talked about earlier, the bride of Christ, that's the bride of Christ. So the bride will be drawn to the groom and not to the friend of the groom. Today, we see many, many teachers and preachers who try to draw the attention away from the bride uh, or away from the bridegroom to themselves. But it's all about Jesus. It's not about them. It's not about us. We must have a vital relationship with the groom as a true friend. And that includes carrying out his wishes, which we call obedience. Me becomes a word that fades into insignificance. A true friend does not want to get in the way. Today, things are tough. A lot of sickness, a lot of turmoil, a lot of wars. No matter how, thing, how tough things do get, we must always remember that God is still in control. He's in charge. And at the end of it all, We'll all meet together with him on the sea of glass.
things he has done. People rejoice, O oh, come to the Father, through Jesus the Son, great thanks. you call us your friend. Dismiss us now with your blessing. Give us traveling mercies. And may the power, the honor, and the glory be yours forever. In Jesus' name, amen.